so much. Let's take our Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation, chapter number 1, verse 3. Revelation chapter number 1, verse 3. Once you've found that, just hold your finger there and you'll probably end up turning the page, perhaps, in your Bible over to verse number 20. We're going to read those two verses. Once you've found that, I'll invite you to stand, if you're able, as we read together. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Verse number 1, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Then over to verse number 20, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word once again this morning. We are so grateful for its power, its authority, its direction for us. Your word is inexhaustible, and we're so grateful that you have given that to us today. We have it within our palms, within our grasp today. The encouragement we need in our lives, the direction in raising our families, the uh, decision-making when it comes to our schooling or our careers or the future that you have before us and the hope of eternity in heaven. Now I pray that today you'll speak to our hearts as only you can do, that your name would be glorified and lifted up. Father, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray that today would be the day they drive a stake in and make today the day they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior to change their world in which they live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. It's an interesting uh, consideration. If we look at verse number 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand is an explanation of what uh, John saw in verse number 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot and girt about with the paps of the golden girdle. Now remember we said last week, this was the, uh, the, the dress or the uniform of the priest in the temple back in Old Testament times and Jesus Christ is now our high priest in heaven doing those very things for us here on earth today. And now as we consider uh, what it speaks of the uh, seven churches. And I love it when the Bible just explains itself. We don't have to figure out, calculate, or, or speculate on who he's talking about here because in verse 20 it tells us who the seven uh, stars are uh, you know, and the seven golden candlesticks being the seven angels and the seven churches. And we'll look at that in more detail in uh, a couple of weeks in uh, verses uh, 1, uh, starting in chapter number 2 all the way to the end of chapter number 3 because in Revelation, chapter 1 is all about Jesus Christ, a description of the Lord Jesus Christ like none other we have in the Bible. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 is all about the churches, the letters to the churches, and then there's no more mention of the church until chapter 19. From chapter number 4 uh, right through to chapter 19, we have a lot of prophetic events that are yet to come, both things spoken of in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a time of great tribulation the Bible speaks of, but the church is not present during that time. At that time, we will already be in heaven with our Savior. Uh, what takes place is a thing we call the rapture, and that is uh, being caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, as it's described in Thessalonians and Corinthians, as uh, God. God's people being taken up to meet the Lord who comes for his people. And those that are left will have to go through the great tribulation period. If you are not saved, you want to get it taken care of. You do not want to have to go through that time. You say, well, when's that going to be? That cannot be 100 years, 200 years. We thought that uh, perhaps maybe a couple of centuries ago, uh, 100 years ago, people were thinking, well, you know, look at the change around us. must be going to happen soon. My grandfather said to me, Leonard, I don't believe that I will die before Christ comes back. That's what they believed, you know, and that's how I feel today. When we see current events in Iran with China and Russia, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine, which is taking place in Israel today, we look at the current events, we say, it must be soon. And as we consider, we uh, look at these numbers today, and I want us to focus, kind of stepping back a little bit from not our study in Revelation, because this is very, very pertinent to that, but considering the importance of numbers in the book of Revelation. It's interesting, I had to take my pickup truck in to get uh, repaired uh, not so long ago, and so what they did was ask me for my phone number. I said, well, it's on your screen. He said, yes, is this this? I said, yes, it is. And he said, I had all of their information 
uh, you know, that they had collected over me over the last 12 years on my pickup truck. They knew what dates I had oil changes, they had what year my truck was, and all the information through the digital uh, uh, accumulation of those numbers, starting with my phone number, and then all the other numbers came together. You know, today we look at the digital age and technology uh, in New Heights. I, I th I've mentioned to you before, I have a very good friend in Israel, his name is Dan Harkaby. I stayed with him and his family when I rode my horse across the Judean desert. He was my riding partner, and I was way outclassed. This guy's a genius, and he's the man that invented the USB stick for the computer. I said, Dan, what did you make that out of? In uh, very simply just out of God's products. You know, you take uh, uh, silica sand, melt it down, and it is solidifies, and uh, you can store information on that. I don't understand how, but it, it works, obviously, because it works in our computers. But it's amazing how much can be done so quickly, and huge blocks of information can be stored on such small, small chips, and even getting smaller all the time. The digital information is basically just two numbers, zero and one something and nothing. Or, as we read in chapter number one uh, at the beginning, Alpha and Omega. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. That's the beginning and the ending. So what book in the Bible do we look at when we want to think about numbers? Well, we'd think of, you know, the book of numbers, but not so today. We're going to be looking at Revelation, of course. In verse number 20, gives us a key. Notice it once again. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars, are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And so that's a, it gives us very definite uh, information who he's talking about. Some have speculated the seven angels uh, you know, we have the seven churches, clearly, who that is, chapter 2 uh, and 3 give us an outline of those churches, as did here in uh, chapter number 1. Uh, you have the, uh, the churches in uh, Asia, Ephesus, uh, the Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Um, and then some have speculated that the seven angels would possibly be the pastors of those churches. Uh, that's not so. Never have you seen pastors referred to as angels. You've known me many years now, almost 25 years. You know I'm no angel. And uh, so we, uh, who laughed? <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, we know that we're just people, but we're speaking of God's angels here. That's who it's de uh, de depicting. So when we consider this, seven is a key number in understanding the book of Revelation. Seven occurs as a number 187 times in the Bible. Uh, the phrase sevenfold. Um, it comes uh, 70 times. Uh, there are 50 occurrences of the number seven just in Revelation alone. And then we notice uh, uh, how relevant numbers are. Um, you know, uh, it's an interesting thing to me. Number nine is a very interesting number. You take it and you multiply it, and it's always coming back to the number nine. So one times nine equals nine. Two times nine equals 18. Well, take 18 and add that together. One, eight, you come to nine. Three times nine is 27. Two plus seven equals nine. Four times nine is 36. Three plus six equals nine. 5 times 9 is four, uh, 45, or 4 plus 5 equals 9. And you go on and on and on. It's a marvel when you start to study those things. You see, God is a God of order. God is a God of uh, uh, not just happenstance, but he has everything in line in creation. Chapters number 2 talks about seven churches. Chapters 4 through 7 talk about seven seals. Chapters 8 through 11, seven trumpets are revealed. Chapters 12 through 14, you have seven persons spoken of. In chapter 15 and 16 of Revelation, you have seven bowls. And chapter 17 through 20 are seven judgments. So throughout the Bible, and most importantly in Revelation, which we're studying here over the next uh, uh, couple of months, numbers mean so much. You ever notice uh, you find an organized use of numbers all throughout the universe? We serve a God of order, a God of design, a God of balance, and of mathematical precision. 
You know, stars and planets and science know exactly where they will be in the future at any particular time. It can be calculated. They move according to the mathematical law. As is uh, NASA found out with Apophorus, number 99942 is the category that Apophorus falls under. Um, and it was thought in 2004 that an Apophorus, which was later given the name Wormwood, which we will see later on in the Bible, uh, would collide with planet Earth uh, sometime in 2005. I'm sorry, not 2005, um, 2025, in a couple of years. Um, now they're saying, no, that was a miscalculation. It will miss the Earth by 19,000 miles. Uh, it's traveling at like an incredible uh, rate of speed. And if it does collide with the Earth, uh, it will be catastrophic, almost catastrophic enough to outline what we see in Revelation. And so who knows, it might well be wormwood as depicted in the Bible, or it might be uh, some other occurrence altogether, but it is a fascinating thing to study it, to see the possibilities, because if it is 2025, it's like that's only a year and a half away. Um, we look at the, uh, the seven feasts of uh, the book of Leviticus, and you have the feast of uh, uh, the, the spring feast, you know, the, uh, the, and the fall feast. You have the uh, Day of Atonement um, and the uh, fall feast of the tabernacles. But the interesting thing is you have the feast of trumpets in September of 2024, 2025, and almost all significant things that happen during the feast of trumpets uh, throughout ages, you can trace some very, very prominent things happened on Feast of Trumpets. Well, perhaps it will be the Feast of Trumpets in September when Jesus Christ will blow that trumpet and we will be caught up in the air to meet him together. We don't know. It's speculation because the Bible says no man knows a day or the hour, but we can sure tell the season, can't we? And we're in the season today. What does Revelation 1-3 say? We read it. The time is at hand. We are not that far away. We look at the body. You, you have trillions of cells that make up your body. Um, and each one of us is exactly 46 chromosomes. You know, man didn't invent mathematics. He discovered the principles of mathematics. They were already there. And we're still learning how to use them. Um, God built numbers into all that he has created. And the authors of the Bible knew that numbers are more important than perhaps science could even understand. There's a very, very deep spiritual meaning when it comes to numbers. God uses numbers throughout the Bible in order to convey a very deep message for us. Um, each number that we talk about has a special meaning, symbolism sometimes, yes, and significance. And when we say studying the book of Revelation, how do you study it? Do you study it as a book of symbolism or do you study it literally? Well, the answer is yes. It is a book of symbolism and when you find out what that symbol means, you believe it literally for what it means. So number one, in the Bible, it speaks of unity and primacy. It speaks of God. That's God's number, number one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, go there. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. His number is one. He is one Lord. Go to Zechariah 14 and verse 9. Zechariah 14 verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Lord and his name, one. That's God's name, number one. I can't hardly go to back, uh, the book of Zechariah without thinking of a message that Pastor Gibbish preached not so long ago. Um, you, maybe you don't even realize it when you preached it, Brother Gibbish, but it was in Zechariah chapter number six. And it said this, I don't think it had anything to do with your message, but it jumped out at me. Verse six said, the black horses which are, are therein go forth into the north country. Well, that's interesting. I've been praying about a horse for a while and I uh, just got a message here two weeks ago that a good friend of mine over in Saskatchewan wants to give me a black bay horse. And I thought, well, maybe he will be coming to the north country. Who knows? 
But as we consider uh, uh, God's name, number, and direction, it is always pointing to number one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, it says, There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That says a whole lot in just uh, those uh, couple of verses. When it comes to God, he is number one. God is a trinity and yet we serve one God. Don't get the idea that we uh, serve three different gods, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are one God. Um, If you serve three gods, that's polytheism, and that's idolatry, but we serve one God. When when I go to Cambodia, and uh, um, by the way, I got a message while we were waiting here from Cambodia uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, because numbers matter there too. Um, Brother Roth sent me a message, and in church service this morning, which was last night, um, they're 20, 12 hours different, uh, they had 130 people in church Sunday morning. What a blessing. And uh, we had quite a few visitors there, and thankful for uh, the work that's going on there. But we see, uh, here we have God is always number one. In Cambodia, if I share the word of God with somebody, they will gladly receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They will pray with you. But because they are polytheistic, they worship the, the river, they, wa- they worship the stars, the sun, they, they worship uh, all kinds of creatures. So when you ask them if they would get saved and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, they just add him to one more God. They just mark them up as one more to the group. Uh, and so it takes some education, teaching, no, there is only one God that you need to put your faith and trust in for salvation. Once they have it, my, they hang on to it. We have some marvelous soul winners in Cambodia. So thankful for the steadfastness and the work that they do there in Cambodia. Number two is the number of witness or confirmation. So number one, we have God. Number two is witness and confirmation. Uh, uh, confirmation. Go to John chapter 8 verse 17. John 8 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. In the Old Testament it took two witnesses to establish a matter to confirm something that was true. Um, in a business meeting. And by the way, we'll have one here in uh, two more weeks. Um, it takes a motion, and uh, the second person, uh, uh, we call the person that seconds a motion. Uh, so you have a first person make a motion, a seconder uh, that seconds a motion. Um, and if that motion is not seconded, it dies for lack of a second motion because it takes two to confirm a motion. And by the way, uh, the Deacons and Pastor Gibbich and I met this week and uh, the printout for 2023, the, uh, uh, the totals for the year are on the back table along with the budget for 2024. They're for you to take. You can go over them uh, and uh, then we will have a business meeting in two weeks. Then we'll be looking at numbers. In a different light, of course. The Bible is divided into two parts. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us what is to come, and the New Testament confirms it. Uh, who is the second person in the Trinity? The Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, and uh, we read about him in chapter 1 of uh, Revelation. Revelation 1.5. He is the faithful witness, the Bible says. That's what he is called, the faithful witness. When the disciples went to empty the tomb, how many angels were there uh, to confirm that he had indeed risen from the dead and that he was not there? How many angels? There were two angels to confirm that which was taking place. Forty days after Jesus ascended up into heaven, after being raised from the dead miraculously from the Mount of Olives, how many angels were there witnessing the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ? Two angels. Revelation 11.3, look there. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses that they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. 
When Jesus sent out the disciples to witness in the New Testament, the new church, how did he send them? Two by two. That's God's method. And it's still the best method today. Uh, when you go to witness to somebody, um, uh, you go by yourself, and if you're not careful, you could be prone to discouragement. Um, but going in twos makes it uh, better. Going more than two is bad. Then it looks like you're ganging up on people, and that's not good. But by yourself, it helps you to be a little bolder when you share the gospel. Number two is a number of witness and and confirmation. Number three, that speaks of the Holy Trinity. Number one spoke of the unity of God, and number three speaks of the triunity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We serve a triune God. You see, that's confusing. I know, but uh, stay with me. I hope this will help. Matthew 28, verse 19. Look there. Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's our God. That's the God we serve. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You have a picture of all three. uh, Our God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit here at the baptism of our Savior Jesus Christ. The whole Trinity is present and it's a very beautiful picture for us. You say, well, I don't understand. Me either, quite frankly. (laughs) Praise the Lord for that. Um, Don't be like the cults that say, well, I don't understand it, so it must not be true. But rather believe it in faith and thank God that he's bigger than our finite minds can even grasp. You will never be able to understand God. He's so far above us. You can't even understand outer space, and neither can I. We have a finite mind that says there must be a wall there, and you travel and travel and travel and travel throughout the, the universe, and you think, I'll finally get to the end of the universe, but what's beyond you know, we have a finite mind that just can't comprehend that. You blow a fuse trying to figure it out. But I'm thankful that we serve a God that is not constrained to our finite thinking. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 8. Go there, Revelation 4, 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Then we look at Isaiah chapter 6. Go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings, which twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Why not just twice? Holy, holy. Why not just once? But holy, holy, holy three times. Again, a picture of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, God has designed us, created us in his own image. And thus, man is also a trinity. You, maybe you don't know that, but you are a trinity. You have a body that is which contains you. That's what you see here. That's your physical body. Um, that's the house you live in. Uh, but that's not really you. That's just you, where you live. Um, then you have your soul. That's you. The soul is that element that will never die. goes on and lives forever and ever and ever. And you have a spirit. And you have a spirit and it is a dead spirit until you trust Christ as Savior. And the Apostle Paul says you are quickened or made alive. And then you become not just a two-part person, but a full three-part person as God intended for you to be. That spirit died when we go back to sin that was initiated in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning. So you have a physical, emotional, and a spiritual nature. You have a body. 
that which contains you, your soul, which is you. And then you have your spirit, which is quickened or made alive when you get saved. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God created us in his image, a three-part being. God also created time, past, present, and future. Um, all are very distinct, uh, yet all are a part of the very same entity. Um, and none can exist without the other. God created space. When you do calculus and so on, you have height, width, and depth. Um, and again, all are distinct, all are important, yet all are a part of the same, and none can exist without the other. Then we come to the number four, the number of the earth or the world or creation. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, some liberals say, well, the Bible isn't true. Uh, the writers thought the earth was four square, um, not round like we know it today. Well, that's ridiculous logic because Isaiah himself said in chapter 40, verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Isaiah is talking about four corners of the earth using an idiom that we use talking about the four points of the compass, north, east, south, and west. He's saying he'll gather the Jews from every direction around the world. Of course, we know the Jews were scattered, and today they're coming back to Israel in droves uh, like we have never seen before. We support an organization called Aliyah. That is uh, uh, an organization in Israel that helps Jews come back and get established. Of course, right now, with the war that's going on there, it's become more difficult, but it's not stopped. People are still coming back to Israel. Uh, Jews, as the Bible <laughs> prophesied, would happen. And as we consider Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, and end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. Revelation chapter 7, verse number 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, the wind that should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And then if we go to Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8. And when the thousand years were expired, or are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So if you study world history of our world, you'll find four world empires over the, the centuries prior to 2024. You had the Babylonian Empire. Uh, at the beginning, you had the uh, uh, Medo-Persian Empire, Persia, which is modern-day uh, Iran. And then you had the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. You say, oh, I got you now because there's going to be another empire in the last days. Uh, that's true, there will be, but it is not a new empire. Revelation describes it as nothing more than a revival of the Roman Empire, the fourth, em not three and a half, fourth empire. Daniel chapter 2, we see Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He saw an image. The head was made of gold. The beast, uh, or the breast and the arms were made up of silver. Um, that was the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, and then the belly, the thighs were of brass, that was the Greek Empire, and the legs were made of iron, and that was the Roman Empire. But what about the feet? You have the iron mixed with clay. That's the revived Roman Empire, and that's made up of ten nations. So number four, the number of earth, uh, and the multiples of four carry a very similar meaning. Um, for example, uh, in Exodus chapter 40, uh, it symbolizes earthly trials and tribulations. It rained, remember, on Noah, 40 days and 40 nights. How long did Nineveh have to repent? 40 days. Uh, Jesus was fasting in the wilderness for how long? 40 days. Uh, 40 years the Jews were wandering in the wilderness. But how long did it take to spy out the land? 40 days. So then we come to the number five, and that's used interchangeably. Um, uh, you ever heard of the five and dime store? Well, this number five is used interchangeably with five and ten. It symbolizes fullness and completeness. So you have a complete person that has five senses. Five fingers per hand equaling ten, because you have two hands. Five toes per foot 
you have two feet equals ten. Uh, when God gave Israel his complete moral law, how many commandments were there? There were ten. Revelation 13, number one. Look there, Revelation 13, one. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. So ten horns, that's complete dominion during this time. Ten crowns is indicative of complete rule. And uh, we'll look into this later on uh, when it says, uh, and I stood up upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. We're seeing this is symbolic. He's not coming out of the, uh, uh, the ocean, out of the water, or out of the, uh, the Red Sea, out of the water. He's coming out of the sea that John is trying to describe in first century language, a sea of people. And if you have watched on, your, uh, on the internet or television, the mass numbers in countries like China or India today, when you see people that are gathered together, as far as I can see, just hedge bobbing of millions of people in one area, that's what it's referring to, coming, a person coming up out of the sea out of those people or those people groups. Six and seven, six is the number of a man. Man was created on the sixth day. And during the tribulation, no one will be able to buy or sell anything unless they associate themselves with a number six. Um, we look at our barcode. At the beginning of the barcode is number six. Middle is number six. The end of the barcode is number six. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 says this. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six, six, six. Why three sixes? Because three is a number of the Trinity. Six is a number of man. And that uh, six is there three times is interesting because the number of the Trinity here is man pretending to be God. That's what the Antichrist is all about. That's what Satan has always desired when he fell from heaven and uh, was expelled from heaven. He said, I shall be like the Most High. That's always been his desire, to be like God. Uh, that, that's his, his whole desire. That's his whole hope. So if you look at this image literally, um, we, we see clearly um, that it is a picture of Antichrist coming up out of the sea or out of people. And some speculate he may be alive today. I suspect he is. Um, I, I have no reason to believe he's not because the Bible says the time is at hand. When we look at the seasons around us, I think it's quite likely. Do I know it for sure? Can I be dogmatic about it? No, uh, I can't. All I can say is it's speculation, but I think fairly good speculation in 2024. So if you took this image literally, it would be kind of a hideous looking um, uh, thing that we are looking at in verse number 5 of chapter 6. Or, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse number 6. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and on the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all of the earth. So if we look at this, uh, again, obviously, we're dealing with symbolism. Seven horns speaks of his perfect power. The Antichrist had ten horns, which speak of perfect, or not perfect, but complete power. But praise the Lord, the Lamb of God has perfect power. Jesus Christ is the Word. He is the Lamb of God. He is the second person in the Trinity. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, speaking of Jesus Christ. Then it says, Seven uh, eyes speaks of His perfect omniscience. He sees everything. He knows everything. How many times did Joshua and his host march around Jericho? Seven times. How many times uh, are the churches that we were to study in chapter 2 and 3 mentioned? Well, seven churches. And Peter asked the Lord about forgiveness. How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Now, he was really going out on a limb here because the Old Testament said uh, that you were to forgive the, you know, what the old rabbis would say three times. And that was you know, what they would consider going, oh, really stretching it. But Jesus said, no. Jesus said 70 times 7. That's perfect forgiveness. Um, Jesus said, I'm not here to condemn the law, but to fulfill the law. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel said, God's prophetic calendar contains 70 weeks um, of years uh, or 70, uh, 70 year periods. So what is a week of years? It is seven. 
So seven years is a week of years, 490. Uh, while seven is the number of perfection, what do you have when you cut it in half? You have, well, like me, three and a half. And so that spells disaster and despair. When Elijah prayed for God to shut up the heavens and stop the rain, how many years did he stop the rain for? Three and a half years. Jesus commenting on that same thing later on in the book of Matthew. Three and a half years, the uh, heavens were uh, shut up. The Antichrist will begin a seven-year tribulation by Mark, mark it down. There will be a covenant made between Israel uh, that nobody else has ever been able to do. And everybody will marvel at it. Finally, peace in the Middle East, peace in Israel. Finally, peace among the Palestinians and the Israelis. And he will make a seven-year uh, covenant, but at the three-and-a-half-year period, he will break it. He will mimic perfection in his seven-year treaty and then break it halfway at three-and-a-half. Number eight speaks of new things, new beginnings. When a male Jewish boy is born, when is he circumcised? On the eighth day. The eighth day on the calendar represents a new week. The eighth note on a musical uh, instrument like our piano begins a new octave. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, God spared not the old world but saved Noah. What? The eighth person or eight people were saved by God in the ark uh, when God destroyed the world with a flood. And those eight God made a new beginning. So number one, there is a God. His number is one. He is number one. Number two, he has witnessed to us. We see him uh, everywhere we look in, in you know, the beauty of the world we live, in nature around us, in the numerical aspect around us. Um, number three, he has manifested himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we are, uh, uh, we have a body, soul, and spirit. This world is headed for judgment. That is clear. Unsaved people will agree. This world cannot sustain itself at its current rate. Uh, and we are headed for destruction unless something happens. Well, we know what that something is. Jesus Christ is coming back. Mark it down. He will come. He is not mocked. He will fulfill his promises. And then number five, God will finish what he started. And number six, all men are sinners. And that's the first step of being saved. When someone comes to the knowledge that they are a sinful person, that's the first step of salvation because they must first recognize they have faults, that they're not perfect. They have to recognize it. Yeah, you know, I do make mistakes. And number seven is a number of a perfect God. A perfect God that can save imperfect people is we all are by the number six. And number eight, we can be born again. That is a new beginning. When we see God's fingerprint all over the world and nature, when we consider the precision of which the Bible speaks about prophecy and how it is fulfilled, it's just another evidence that there are no fables, fairy tales that we are following. It is facts from the word of God. We serve a God of order, precision, and design. And he is all about numbers and wants to again see his people saved by multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. God loves you this morning. I don't care who you are. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to be saved today. You say, you have no idea what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. I know that the God we serve knows what you've done. He knows what I have done and everybody else has done. And he loves us enough. He sees past that. And his love and forgiveness by sending his son Jesus Christ to the cross to die and shed his blood that our sins could be uh, uh, cleansed because of his shed blood. He paid the penalty for us so we could go to heaven. You know, it's a matter, you know, uh, how many we you know, represent, even in a, in a building like this or even listening online today, um, God has a plan for every individual. That plan is for you to be born again. That plan is for you to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Why? He cares for every single one as an individual. Not looking at us as a multitude uh, or, or a group uh, or, or a body of people in this building today, but he looks at you as an individual. God loves individuals. And if you were the only person on the whole planet, Jesus would have still died for you. He cares for you that much. He loves you that much. Friend, if you don't know him as your Savior, can I encourage you? Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. 1969 uh, uh, 
in Codrington Street Public School in Barrie, Ontario. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior as a 15-year-old boy. I've never regretted it one day. And I look forward to one day seeing my Savior face to face. And it will happen one day. And I believe with all my heart the time is at hand. I believe that time is not that far in the distant future. How long will it be? Christ could come today. He could come next week. We don't know exactly the moment it will happen. But can I just encourage you, don't wait for that moment unless you are saved. If you are saved, we look forward to the return of our Savior. But if we are here and you're not saved, get it settled today before it's too late. Because if Christ should come and the church is taken up out of the world, you could still be saved, but the Bible says you would die as a martyr. Why not do it when it's easy today Then put it off? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your goodness to us, for the blessings we have from your word. Thankful for each person that's here today, those that are listening online. Father, we just pray that if there's one here that's not saved, they'd get that settled today. They'd come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and walk out of this place a brand new person, or if they're sitting in their living room listening today, that they too might come to the realization that yes, they are a sinful creature and they need a God in heaven that's paid that price for them that they could go to heaven. And as that realization affects their heart, I pray they'll make that all-important step, a transformation to become a brand new individual today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your hymn.